Today, Governor Lowe and the Reserve Board met and they kept the cash rate on hold. Now, the good news story here has been in some of the language that's been coming out from Governor Lowe and also the board in regards to how positive they have felt and, and how sort of optimistic they are about where we sit. Now, they had three, obviously, case scenarios. They had a very pessimistic and worst case scenario. They had a midpoint scenario and they had a best case scenario. And in a lot of the commentary that we've seen coming out of all of the people at the Reserve Bank has been around that we're sitting between the really positive story and the midpoint. So the best case scenario and that midpoint. And that is pleasing. it, And that is obviously on the back of the fact that Australia has done very, very well in containing the virus up to date. Now, of course, we've got some issues around Victoria and what's happening there, but the other parts of Australia have been opening up and we are starting to see some economic activity return. So I'll talk more about that when I get into the summary of the Australian data. But I wanted to start firstly with the Chinese data. And we did see here in terms of what was happening in China, China is very much a story of compliance. Um, whether the people in China like it or not, um, they are very compliant with the rules and regulations and they have obviously been very effective at stopping the virus over there. And that has meant that uh, they have been able to ease their economy out into a more broader active, active economy. Um, and we did see some data coming in from Goldman Sachs that's showing that the economy is really back to normal and in some cases above normal activity. So we're talking about traffic congestion, which is probably also a byproduct of less people on the subway systems over there. Coal usage, car sales, steel demand, property sales are all above normal activities from this time last year. So that is a really positive sign. We're still seeing people being um, sensible about their activities. So we're not necessarily seeing people doing the sort of same level of dining and also, you know, domestic travel. Um, has also been restricted um, and airline travel uh, associated with that. But when we start to take a deeper dive into their data, we can see the uh, the Cajun uh, Purchasing Managers Index, and I hope I'm saying that correctly. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing that. But the PMI index rose to a 10-year high of 58.4 in June. Um, and that was from a 55 reading, um, which was the best consensus uh, in regards to what the economists were predicting there. Now, that means that the supply and demand and services recovery, the sub-index has also been measuring very, very well as well. So in terms of the service index, um, that's gone to a seven-month high of 54.4. So, you know, we're seeing the, the manufacturing and purchasing index up to a 10-year high of 58.4, and then that, uh, that servicing index at a seven-month high of 54.4. So remembering that anything above 50 is expansionary, anything below 50 is contracting uh, in that economy. Now, so obviously that's the second biggest economy in the world. Let's now focus in on the US story. And the US story is one of non-compliance. It's one of um, the freedoms uh, that the US enjoy uh, basically being um, exposed in regards to this virus. And so with that, lack of control and lack of compliance. We're obviously seeing the virus spreading um, further into the US and we're seeing some challenges around that. However, in terms of what we saw in the data, um, the US economy added 4.8 million jobs in June. That's the sharpest monthly gain on record um, as, uh, again, the regions across the US decided to ease their social distancing restrictions um, and those businesses reopened. Um, now, that outcome was well above consensus where they expected only 3.2 million. So it did pop um, higher than that. But also don't don't be mindful, two months ago, um, we did see a record decline in April of 20.8 million um, job losses in that area. So the unemployment level uh, rate fell from the May levels of 1.3% to 11.1% in June. So that is still a significant level of unemployment, uh, which is still historically high levels um, and certainly well above their pre-pandemic level of 3.5%. Now, consensus was expecting that, you know, at 11.1% to actually be as high as 12.5%, but we didn't see that materialise yet. So it is interesting times in the US. Um, we're seeing obviously these record number of cases. 
In terms of fatality rates, interestingly enough, we are seeing them do quite well um, in terms of keeping the fatality rates down. But this is a very serious disease and, and now there's sort of a big question mark in terms of how the US economy will perform if the virus continues to spread out of control in that particular market. The other big talking point around the globe has been equity markets. They continue to surprise on the upside. Um, we're, we're, you know, whilst we're seeing this record spread of COVID-19 and the coronavirus throughout the globe, um, where the contagion is getting further and further out of control, um, we are definitely seeing um, global uh, equity markets performing better than expected, and a huge, you know, the, you know, a, a massive. Uh, bear market followed by this, um, you know, which was the shortest bear market in history when we consider that the gains have been well and truly above 20% in this current bull market. Now, the question is, why is this the case? Um, now, uh, I'm not an expert in world equity markets. Uh, I never said I would be, but very simplistically, one can understand that money is cheap um, and the world's uh, reserves, are, you know, they're sort of the governors and, and the reserve banks around the world are all doing everything to make money cheap. Um, and with that obviously comes poorer returns in terms of putting money in term deposits and in banks. And so we're seeing um, for the first time ever, lots of people uh, getting into the stock market, maybe punting on the stock market might be a better example of that. And we are definitely seeing them focusing on, you know, some of the changes that, are, that have started to materialize around the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is, um, there's very much been an outperformance on digital uh, tech stocks, uh, any type of digital um, transformation that's going on, you know, from car sellers, which is, you know, obviously Tesla, uh, robotics, um, consumer goods, online spending, all of those types of stuff that we're seeing. So the Amazon, the Googles, uh, the Facebooks, um, the Netflixes of this world doing incredibly well as we move more through this digital age. Um, and we're seeing a rapid expansion of that. Now, obviously, will this last time will tell um, in terms of whether this has been a false dawn in terms of what's happening in the equity markets. And that's going to be on the back of obviously how much patience everyone has and also our success in controlling the pandemic and the fatality rates and then the economic impact that that has. So um, that's one to watch. I would always say be very, very careful in terms of going into this market, because one thing that will be guaranteed is that these markets will be highly volatile over the coming weeks and months um, as we learn more about um, what's going to be happening with uh, with this virus spread around the globe. Turning our attentions to Australia, I wanted to start off um, with the most important data, and that is consumer confidence. Um, so um, we have seen um, effectively um, Victoria have an incredibly disappointing owned goal. So yes, New South Wales had the Ruby Princess, but uh, I think Victoria are going to gazump that um, in a massive way uh, by the way in which they've handled their hotel quarantining rules and regulations, which has led to um, a rapid spread of the virus here in Melbourne. And that is obviously causing some concern. And we've seen that show up in the weekly ANZ Roy Morgan reports uh, where consumer confidence survey is down to a 93 from 97.5. So that was the result the last last week of June. We saw that result come in um, again, led you know by the concerns that people have around the spread in Victoria. Um, in terms of business confidence, which is the other interesting measure um, that we're seeing come through, um, this is positive and this is pleasing um, in terms of the Roy Morgan business confidence was up 5.1%. This is the June 3 release, sorry, July 3 release. Um, so up 5.1% to 95 in June. The highest, uh, Western Australia, you know, very, very small number of cases, active cases. Um, their confidence is riding high at 110.5, followed by New South Wales, which is now starting to see sporting events opening up and, and more normality uh, in their uh, lifestyle, and so they have confidence running at 100.7 uh, compared to the, the second economy, the second biggest economy, which is the Victorian economy, which is running currently at 84.4. Now, that June data um, really does point to, you know, 
an indication that when you have mobility and people are able to move around, everyone seems to be more optimistic and confident and that's spreading through to the data that came through. So Western Australia, New South Wales, Queensland, all um, feeling quite positive about their situation. Um, states like Victoria and Tasmania, um, which have had these clusters uh, and bursts have also uh, felt the impact in terms of the confidence around their economy. So that is you know, good to understand that you know that when you do get this mobility and and an understanding of the virus, um, and you can see that there are sort of some partial lockdowns versus widespread lockdowns, the easing of those restrictions really does change the mindset to a positive, optimistic mindset relatively quickly. Bearing in mind, um, you know, a hundred is the flat line there, so we are by no means out of the woods yet, but it certainly gives us some confidence around that. Now let's talk about employment. Um, so. This is a difficult one to, to make commentary on because there's so many unknowns. Um, so we have, we have a situation where we have an employment base um, where there's a lot of people on JobKeeper and we really don't know what's happening about that. So I'll come back to that in a second. So we did see uh, 228,000 jobs in May, uh, those job losses. Um, obviously the second biggest drop uh, in the history of the survey and that was on the back of 607,000 in April. So that saw the unemployment rate jump to uh, 7.1 in May from 6.4% in April, the highest obviously since October of 2001. The other thing that we've also seen is the participation rate. So I've talked about this in previous updates where I felt that that was the main measure that we wanted to, to focus in on. But the reality is, is under the job seeker and job keeper packages, under the job seeker package, participation rate wasn't relative for you to for you to be getting job seeker. So that's why we have seen the participation rate fall. So in in terms of some of the numbers that we've seen, um, we are seeing uh, some economists such as St George Bank reporting that if the participation rate, which has fallen from 63.6 to 62.9 had have stayed at 63.6, then the unemployment rate across Australia would be around 8.1%. We still have challenges around underemployment. We're, we're well aware of those challenges in terms of that. But the, the other point that I wanted to focus in on was around the job keeper. So a lot of people and media commentary have been sort of misreporting, in my view, um, you know, once they add job keeper into the mix, they're quoting um, double digit numbers of unemployment uh, in that sort of 13, 15, 20% range. The reality is, is that businesses are, are getting JobKeeper and, and of those businesses who are getting JobKeeper, those people, th there are still a vast majority of those people who are actually working. Um, I think people get the perception that the JobKeeper package is for people and they don't have to be working. That's not true. And those businesses have reopened. Um, so we really won't know in terms of the percentages of people on JobKeeper, whether they'll maintain their jobs um, until um, post-September. And the other big variable attached to that is, um, we absolutely know that the government will not um, let us fall off any type of fiscal cliff um, and jobs cliff. So, you know, we'll be seeing some announcements later this month around their program and what they're thinking to give businesses some guidance um, and also um, people some guidance and confidence around their situations because there is a lot of media pressure out there sort of saying once we hit this cliff, once we hit this cliff. And we've also heard from the, the Reserve Bank and the Governor Lowe talking about that, that the expectation is that the federal government will be, will be doing more on fiscal policy uh, because pretty much the RBA have done uh, what they needed to do on monetary policy. So that, that to me just sort of says is you know, an unemployment rate of 7.1% is artificial. It's not relative. It's definitely um, around that 10%, maybe even 11% range. And that's probably where it's going to peak. And I think that is what most economists are also now starting to tell us is that we're probably seeing the big um, number of job losses behind us now. And we'll start to see um, some sporadic um, job losses here, 100 jobs there, 200 jobs there, et cetera, et cetera. But we're not going to see these vast volumes of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of job losses as we uh, open up the economy uh, and come out of the severe lockdowns that we uh, that we saw 
in this sort of March, April period. In terms of credit lending, um, so we did see the private credit uh, has fallen by 0.1%. So there's really no, no need for people to be uh, borrowing private funds at the moment. Um, and it's the first decline in nine years. So it's it's quite interesting that we've actually seen a fall because normally with population growth and people taking out loans and credit cards and all those types of things, there's normally a continuous increase in credit levels. That has definitely um, been impacted by the economic shock that we've received. And so private credit is definitely uh, at the lowest levels. Um, in terms of um, business credit, we've also seen the same sort of thing. Uh, business credit has declined 0.6 in May, um, which is the largest monthly fall since June of 2011. Um, and it's obviously on the back of um, businesses aren't necessarily going to be investing or spending yet until they have a clearer line of sight in terms of what's happening in their industry and their level of demand that they're going to get from their consumers in the medium term. Turning our attention to household credit, uh, housing credit, I should say, uh, very subdued. So we saw a growth of 0.2%. Um, and, you know, that is now two consecutive months where we've seen modest growth in this particular area. Um, in terms of investor lending, um, this is something that I want to spend a moment in, in focusing in on. Uh, we did see a fall of 0.3 of 1% in May, and that's the largest decline since August of 1991. So I wanted to pause to think about that. What we are definitely seeing, and I'll be talking more about this uh, when, I, when I get into the property summary, is we're definitely seeing um, less of an appetite for investors to be buying um, the type of what we would call investment stock versus investment grade assets. The vast majority of investors have been um, convinced that buying into medium and high density uh, makes for a good investment because you get all the depreciation and the tax benefits associated with that. Well, we've been saying since day one that that is a silly idea. You should never be investing in property and particular that property segment. Um, and that's starting to now show up and uh, I'll be explaining that in more detail in a minute. Um, in terms of other personal debt, so credit, credit continues to run at extreme weakness. So this is the credit card stuff I was telling you about before. Um, so we did see personal loans, credit cards decline 10.2% uh, in the year to May. Um, that's the weakest on history. Uh, and, you know, this series of data began in 1972. So that just goes to show you there's no people necessarily having to uh, to set up credit cards or use money on credit cards because everyone is basically in a holding pattern trying to work out what's going on in regards to the economy. Now, retail spending. Um, so we talk about no one spending money on credit. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's correlating to what's happening in terms of the retail data. So we saw some remarkable retail um, figures coming out uh, in May. Um, you know, the pent up demand uh, from people at home and the shopping that's going on and the easing of restrictions did see more foot traffic out into retail land and uh, they were outspending. So overall, Turnover rose 16.9% in May. That's a new record following the increase of, uh, of the record decline in April, which was down 17.7%. On an annualised basis, the turnover was 5.8% higher in May, bouncing back from a 9.2% fall in April. Um, the subsectors that saw the boost were well, clothing. So again, people went out and bought some new clothes, footwear, accessories. Um, and you're ready for this? Those sectors rose 129.2% uh, for the month. So obviously when we can't get out, we don't buy things. When we can get out, we do buy things. Um, uh, turnover for the sector is still, however, after that 129% increase, 19.4% uh, weaker than a year ago. So again, we still don't see full mobility and and I suspect what's also playing into that is the Victorian data um, as Victorians uh, are still way late at home in a lot of cases and not necessarily going out uh, and doing their spending that they have. Um, household goods retailing or also um, had a rise of 16.6% in May. Um, and so again, um, you know, focusing in on the home um, as they do. Um, eating um, at home was also very popular. That was up 7.2% and it's 12.9% higher over the year. So people 
are getting takeaways as opposed to going out into restaurants. We are seeing more restaurant and, and cafe activity. Um, you know, there was definitely a, a solid post of 38, sorry, 38.8% 30, increase um, in dining in um, during that month. And again, I suspect that would have been even better if we had have seen more of an opening um, happening up in Victoria. And we'll probably see those numbers now start to plateau um, as um, the economy is starting to um, to move in what we would probably say is a is a two tier economy. So the rest of Australia and then Victoria. So to give you an idea of that, New South Wales has had annualised growth in retail sales of around 4%. Victoria is barely registering 1% annualised. Queensland's over 10%. South Australia sort of sitting around 7%. 7 Western Australia quite strong at, at around sort of 12 to 13%. Tasmania greater than 10%, Northern Territory greater than 10%, the ACT sitting around 5%. So overall around 5.5% to 6% of retail annualised um, sales. But Victoria is definitely the handbrake uh, when it comes to uh, progress in that particular area. The other thing that I thought was also uh, of interest to study at this point was just around um, what do Aussies spend when we go overseas? So I went looking for some of that data and and I found some data that was uh, that was quoted um, this month in regards to that data. And what we saw was Australians spend $65 billion in overseas holidays last year, and international visitors spent $45 billion in spending in Australia. So the question's got to be, if we're not going overseas because of these restrictions, where is that $65 billion dollars going to land. And I've been mentioning this in my previous economic update last month. That money is hitting our balance sheets. The household balance sheet has now got more money in it. We are doing different things with that money. We are definitely seeing saving rates increasing. We're seeing debt levels being paid down as people are more cautious about spending that money. But as you've just seen in those retail sales figures, We've definitely seen some of that money being spent on personal goods and also potentially spent around the house. And we hope that there will be an enormous amount of that money starting to flow into our tourism and retail sectors and hospitality sectors as we are able to uh, to move around. So you're going to start to see more people holidaying in Queensland, except for from Victoria. Um, and we did see um, yesterday, the borders are being closed between Victoria and New South Wales. So there will be potentially a bit of intrastate, uh, intrastate spending, which is great, but also hopefully a little bit of more movement of people moving around Australia as, as we start to live um, and understand the, the, uh, the pandemic and, and get on with our lives. So that is just something to be mindful of. There's a lot of pent up money uh, that needs to find a home. And who knows, maybe that's some of that money flowing into the stock market at the moment. Um, in terms of manufacturing, here's some positive news. The AIG performance of manufacturing index rose to 51.5 in June from 41.6 in May. Now, this index is now above the critical level, so it's in expansion, um, and that is good news. Um, and also good news on that as we've come out of this hiatus is that new orders jumped 20.6% in June, so in, in May, sorry. So that also means that the June numbers um, would also hopefully be in an expansionary state if we're sort of seeing those those new orders in terms of the productivity in our manufacturing sector. So that is a positive sign. Um, building approvals, uh, building approvals fell 16.4% in May. Again, this is lag data driven by obviously the volat volatility in the marketplace. Um, and that's very much in regards to the apartment market. Um, the other dwelling sector approvals sell 34.9%. So that is uh, the private dwelling stuff. So that's the stuff that the government has announced, you know, the, uh, the home builder packages um, to try and get that program moving forward. So turning to construction, we also then saw the Australian Index Group performance of construction index rise from 24.9 in May to 35.5 in June. Um, the improvement fell short of the 50, which is where, you know, it's still not an expansionary mode, but it obviously means that uh, there's definitely improvement. And 
in terms of reading some of the uh, the reports coming out from home builders uh, and land sales area, um, the home builder packages and also the renovation packages have definitely played a role in increasing the number of sales um, that have transpired in the month of June. And we won't see that data for a little while, but we do know in terms of you only need to read the papers um, to see some of the commentary coming out from some of our volume builders are saying that they've had definitely the best, best month of the year so far and potentially best month in years um, and on record. So that does bode well for um, you know further construction uplift um, in the uh, latter part, you know, sort of that'll probably start materialising in in the September data, um, and we'll start to see those those job opportunities in the construction sector um, as vastly um, across the country and and definitely needed in regards to uh, in, in regards to that sector. So now let's talk about the property market. There there is a two speed property market out there, and we've always talked about um, markets within markets. Um, and that is no different. Um, we've seen um, certainly the higher end of the property market, so that top 25% quartile of the market, um, was enjoying the biggest expansion um, in terms of um, capital growth indicators uh, leading out of the middle of last year, mid-2019 through into August, uh, sorry, into February. And, and but they have also been the areas that have probably had the biggest falls. Uh, the middle market, as has been well indicated, is only down around 1% across the nation. Um, so that's just telling you that that, uh, that higher end, the top end of the market is probably having that flatter period or that, uh, that, that higher correction. But more broadly speaking, the, the correction has been incredibly mild, like we said it would be. And I know people are still talking about what's coming and you know this is only the start of it but the reality is um, inside the core logic data that was released um, earlier last week we did see um, some really important indicators here and I wanted to spend a moment on that what what we saw was um, that in April transactions were down a third so they were down 32 percent in April when we were in lockdown we couldn't go and inspect properties and we were basically just trying to work out what this virus was going to do to us. In May, we saw volumes, and this is in terms of sale activity, bounce back by 22% in May. And as we've seen the restrictions ease and auctions and those things start to coming back, in June, we saw a further 30% increase in sales activity. So the combination of the June bounce back and also the May bounce back now means, and I want to emphasise this, means that sales activity is now stronger than what it was this time last year. I'll repeat that. Sales activity is now stronger than it was this time last year. So pre-COVID levels. Now, what does that mean? Because you're sort of thinking, well, how does that happen? Uh, because stocks, uh, stock lists are still quite low. Yes, what we are seeing is new listings are coming on, but that stock is being bought. Okay, so it still means that the stock levels are low. So even though we've seen an increase in stock levels, we've definitely seen all of those properties transacting. And so that is a positive sign that there is buyer demand out there. And Bryce and I have been really clear in terms of our communication that we do see that evidenced in all of our demand supply measures that Jeremy Shepherd delivers to us on a monthly basis, that we do know that there is strong buy demand out there. We also know through market sentiment surveys that is, is it a good time to be buying property? Well, that survey is still sitting very high at over 100, which means that more people believe it's a better time to buy property than not to buy property. And we're seeing that showing up in our data. And that's the area that you get where we're talking about markets within markets. So, you know, good stock is hard to find when it comes on the market, it's actually performing very, very well. The property market in Australia is alive and well in those particular areas. But there is one market, there is one particular market that is going to experience, and we are going to see it in the media, and we're going to see it, you know, basically hype it up um, in terms of you know, the crash of the property market 
No, it's going to be very um, selective in terms of which market is going to experience that significant downturn. And we've said it before, it's going to be the medium and high density apartment market. Now, never before have we seen a black swan event like this for that particular sector. So let's think about this. We've got still new builds being completed at the moment. We're seeing um, the off the plan apartments, 50% of those apartments are settling with valuations under what well, under contract price. And 25% of those as reported by CoreLogic, um, where the 25% the have a material loss of 10% or more. So that is significant. So be mindful of that. We've obviously got the cladding and construction issues that we've seen from the uh, self-regulation that was happening in that industry. Um, so those things are going to be ongoing and costs uh, to people who have bought in those areas with the fire risk on the claddings are just terrible. Um, in terms of the short term stay market is still struggling. Um, so we're seeing a significant oversupply of that type of stock. Um, we've seen hotels also moving into short to medium term rental accommodation uh, to supplement the fact that there are no tourists coming in and staying um, in short term accommodation in the hotels. A reduction in international students from the rental demand side um, and also the immigration program um, has also slowed almost to zero. So with those types of elements, um, this, is, this has never been an event that we've been able to measure from a data point of view. So it is going to be a fascinating exercise in terms of what is the trigger point in regards to what's going to happen to property prices um, in this particular subsection. Okay, And then the question is, is it going to present a systemic risk to the rest of the property market? Well, that's ultimately up to people who buy that story or don't buy that story. So what I mean by that is we are going to see the media hammer this story because it's brilliant clickbait for them. It's sensationalist journalism. And in a lot of cases, there are going to be many, many people who lose money in terms of negative equity in these properties. So that is something to be careful of in our CBD area. So it's only in large concentration of these types of investor grade, sorry, investor stock properties, not investment grade. We don't believe it's going to materialise and flow into the broader property market because there is no systemic risk in those particular marketplaces. So when we're talking about um, distressed mortgage sales, we're seeing no evidence of that more broadly spread. Um, it's more randomised and it's not in clusters. And when you don't get those clusters, you don't get that tipping point in terms of a confidence in that market. So um, it is definitely going to be uh, fascinating in terms of how this particular marketplace plays out um, over the coming weeks and months and what sort of support um, that particular sector gets. Because we have definitely seen, you know, we see the scaremongering going on about this fiscal cliff. Um, we're going to see, as I said, some announcements made by government in regards to job keeper and job seeker programs and what's going to be happening there. But we've also seen, um, again, you don't have to look very hard. A bit of Googling can see you find um, all of the banks are working with their customers and will continue to extend um, deferred payments as required um, to get people through that difficult period. So we are not going to see this um, cliff that is so-called being reported. Um, I stand by that statement, but I but I also believe that if the journalism focuses in on those two, uh, you know, the high rise and medium density stories, um, then people will potentially be a little bit overwhelmed by that. So um, I would be 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 saying to those people, there's really nothing to worry about if you own land um, and a house in the burbs or even a unit in the suburbs, um, you know, where you're not you're not. Uh, part of the large clusters of, of properties in those particular locations. We're seeing rental demand holding up. In fact, we're actually seeing vacancy rates um, starting to stabilise and potentially fall in some of those suburban areas as well. So I don't think there's anything to worry about in that particular area. I now want to turn my attention to something that really is important in terms of we are going to be spending as a nation uh, billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of supporting ourselves through this 
current uh, health and obviously economic crisis. Now, that also then leads into the great tax debate. Where are we going to find the money to repay all this debt over time? You might be hearing some commentary at the moment around modern monetary theory and, and you know, what can potentially take shape and we could just basically, you know, not pay the debt back. But uh, I believe that that has severe consequences more broadly to our currency and I'm not necessarily a, a big believer in that theory at the moment. So I want to focus in on um, the, the one that is probably the most prevalent tax that we can do something about, which has really a lasting effect in terms of our economy, and that is the goods and services tax. And yes, it's really important that we understand we should be taking advantage of this crisis to, to take and have a debate, an informed debate around our taxation policies. And the goods and services tax um, is a, no, no tax is good, but in terms of as a consumption tax, it means those people who consume more pay more tax. And I think that there's an important message in there. Now, when we look at goods and services tax levels around the world, we see that the UK's goods and services tax is at 20%. New Zealand's GST is at 25. Sweden's at 25. Denmark's at 25. And the OECD nations have an average of 19%. Obviously, our GST currently sits at 10%. Um, now, again, no, no new tax is a good tax. And I do think, you know, generally governments have a, a problem with overspending, but it is important that we see what type of changes could happen in regards to having a debate around our goods and services tax. So the GST raises around $70 billion, which is 13% of our total tax base, and that money goes to the states. Um, you know, an increase in the GST to 15% would further raise around $30 billion in new tax revenues. Right now, if you broaden the base even further, you are going to see tax revenues that will increase even greater around that. Because at the moment, currently only 47% of the items that we buy have a GST on them. Now, if we did broaden that base um, to, to include things like fresh fruit, um, health education, all of those types of things, uh, fresh food, those types of things, then our base um, you know, we'd be able to raise around $90 billion a year in additional tax revenues for the nation. Now, what does that money then do? Well, it does a lot of great things in terms of providing for infrastructure, um, spending in hospitals, education, uh, schools, those types of things that are critical um, to keep our economy growing, our people informed and well-educated as we move into the new digital age um, and we can make sure that there's jobs of the future. The other thing that we'll also do is it would take away and, you know, given that the focus is on jobs, it would take away things like payroll tax, which is a shocking tax on businesses to not encourage them to employ more people. And businesses like ours pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in payroll tax when we could be employing more people. Um, it would potentially remove other taxes like vehicle registration taxes to drive on our roads. Um, which will basically help our households out, um, in, you know, in terms of mobility and moving around. And the other big one that it will help is obviously stamp duty. So potentially we could get rid of state-based stamp duties, um, which we heard recently um, when we interviewed Ken Morrison on the Property Couch podcast, that for every dollar raised by stamp duty, 72 cents of damage is done to the economy. And when we talk about that damage that it's done, we're talking about, um, you know, reducing, um, locking people into locations, um, reducing labour mobility and overall economic activity. And so it's an incredibly unproductive tax. And so with that type of change, people could downsize, there would be more mobility, more properties will become available for people to move around in, people could move from city to state um, without having this whopping big tax that they pay. So, so something like that, in my view, definitely needs to be debated. Um, and um, we know that the politicians of the day um, who want to control things and stay in power realise that a GST is politically unfavourable, but it's not so if consumers and households understand this better. Um, you know, in, in terms of 
um, what households spend by way of higher taxes. So again, if I buy a luxury car, if I, if I, you know, want to stay at a fancy hotel instead of a budget hotel, if I want to eat at a fancy restaurant, all of those types of things, I'll be paying more goods and services tax um, as opposed to those people um, who are on a lower income. Now, of course, there's one big thing that we have to do here, and that is we need to make sure that the safety net is in place. We absolutely need to make sure that we have an appropriate safety net to make sure we look after the most vulnerable in our society, agreed. Um, but we also need to make sure that our middle class people don't have social welfare. So we want to try and make sure that we're getting more people moving through the economy, um, looking after those most vulnerable uh, and those in most need, but keeping the economy moving in regards to that. So we have aspirational people in our society who are willing to move forward in that area. But coming back to the politics, you know, politicians are self-interested, right? So this is, they'll look at their numbers, they'll look at the the testing that they do in the, in the society and they'll say, no, no, we don't need to do anything. This is politically uh, poison, so we won't touch it. But if they cut, if they keep coming out and sampling society and people are more informed and they say, no, I'm open to a change in goods and services tax. Once they start seeing that through their polling, um, hopefully we'll see a leader who has the maturity to have the debate and get the reform that we need because we want to take advantage of this situation to set up our economy, set up our tax systems, because it should also result in lower PAYG taxes for people as well. Again, so you pay on consumption, you don't pay on tax or hours worked. Those types of things are just, you know, they're, they're economy killers um, and they don't provide for a prosperous economic outlook. So you can understand my view on this. I think that tax reform in the GST area is going to be far better than, uh, than you know, tweaking at the edges, which is what we've seen um, and what's been happening in all of the Henry tax reviews where they basically haven't included GST in that. So if the people say to the governments that we're open to the idea of a GST, uh, an increase or a broadening of the base, that's going to only be good for the long term reform that we need in this country to have a prosperous economy. So I just wanted to focus in on that to get that conversation out there, because I think it, it is a debate that we need to have. So in summarising my month wrap up, um, there's no doubt that we want to keep an eye on consumer and business confidence. Um, Victoria is definitely taking that hit. So there's going to be a secondary speed and that's disappointing. We would have liked to have seen that that sort of deep V that we did get out of, but we're coming out, but it's going to slow down because of what's happening here in Victoria and the containment. But what we also want to be focused in on is the fact that um, we, we aren't experiencing widespread lockdowns and I don't think we will going forward. Um, if we have a widespread lockdown, it's um, consensus of all economists and people who understand jobs and, and the economic outlook that that would be extremely dangerous um, and will see us into a very, very deep recession. So widespread lockdowns um, will we'll do that. And so we want to avoid them at all costs, which basically means that we want to have these targeted lockdowns and these partial lockdowns to be able to control the virus, to have it at a manageable level, because we always said that's what we want to do. So we will still see the economy opening up um, and we won't see these widespread lockdowns. We've learned a lot from where we've come from, from being quite concerned and nervous and unknown and fearful back in March and April to now knowing we know we know what we need to do. We need to keep people locked down in certain areas and that will slow the spread of the virus um, whilst we're also trying to open up the economy and giving people the opportunity to go to work and earn an income so they can support their families. So it's really important to understand if we keep these partial lockdowns going, um, they're not going to be a material impact on the broader economy. Um, it's only a widespread lockdown that will have that material impact and hopefully we'll get out the other side of it. But we know that obviously with um, the health issue that we've got here um, in terms of the treatment programs that are doing, they're getting better and better each week. Uh, and we're seeing the fatality rate improving in developed nations where they have availability of good health care and services and medicines to be able to do that. And in addition to that, obviously, we await um, you know, results of vaccine trials that are going on around the world. So that is my final message. And it is about, you know, um, we don't have to be as fearful as we were. 
uh, back in those dangerous months where we really had a lot of unknown unknowns. We now know what we know. We now know more about the virus every day, every month. Um, and we've got to go on about living our lives. We've got to make sure that we continue to do our best whilst also practicing social distancing measures, whilst also downloading the COVID-19 app so it makes it easier for people to do the tracing that they need to do and to understand where the spread is occurring. You're only helping yourself and also your fellow citizens. You don't want to be responsible for spreading the virus. If you don't, you know, no one wants to be responsible for that. So keep acting responsibly, uh, but keep going about your lives, keep doing the things that you said you were going to do um, and keep some sort of level of normality in your life. Um, and that will bode well um, for the broader economy and also the broader health and wellbeing outcomes for everyone um, and the job outcomes for everyone in our economy. So that's my message for now. Uh, remembering, um, you know, it is about get busy living and also that knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Until next month, take care, stay safe, um, and we'll talk to you next month.